I bought a camping backpack from an estate sale and I found some pages inside. There was a bundle of papers wadded in a deep pocket of the backpack, but I didn't notice until after I got home. I went back to the house where the estate sale was held and a young woman answered the door. She couldn't say who the backpack belonged to and really had no interest in the papers. Her grandmother was the one who died of old age natural causes. Apparently, she was a bit of a hoarder. So I don't know if I'll be able to track down the source, the handwriting is tiny, and the pages are damaged, but I'll transcribe as faithfully as I can. September 5th. The man on the trail is dead, and will need to be moved. It is a more difficult task than I would have guessed, and nearly impossible for a 5'4 woman with no help and no gurney. I tried to drag him towards the camp right after I found him this morning, but only succeeded in pivoting him and twisting his legs around each other horribly. Bodies look so wrong once they stop feeling pain. I never thought I'd have so much experience with death, but I haven't cried over the loss of someone since the lighthouse. This man also shit his pants before he died, and moving him made the smell worse. Still no sign of Ira or Bill. September 6th. I used Ira's foam sleeping mat like a sled to move the dead man. It still took me an hour to drag him 30 yards, and now the mat is so torn up that I'm questioning whether it was worth the effort. Gary Law, his driver's license and his wallet, he's from Utah. I took the side of him as a good sign at first. Another human on the trail might have meant that we were close to civilization. But now I'm not so sure what he was doing out here or what it means. I can't tell what killed him. No claw marks, no wounds on his hands. He's stoutly built, but with a bagginess about his physique that makes me think he was starving. He died with his mouth open. Every mucous membrane turned ash gray. I don't think he was attacked. It's a relief. If he had been missing a few body parts, the logical thing to do would have been to move camp. But then Ira and Bill would have come back to nothing. I'm more afraid of being separated from them than I am of anything else. Still waiting on them both. September 8th. I spent all day yesterday stripping and burying Gary Law. He was shorter in stature, but his clothes should fit Bill well enough. His feet are small, so I'll be keeping the socks for myself. They're almost brand new, thick blue wool. I could tell he wasn't an outdoorsman. Everything else was new too. New shoelaces, new cross trainers, new windbreaker. None of it quite right for someone trekking this far out. The pants are from Banana Republic, pleated and with a neat sheen. These aren't pristine like everything else, and were hemmed by a tailor. I washed them in the creek, but they still smell like shit and death. Everything does, actually. To the point that I think the smell might be on me. In me. I weighted the pants down on a stone near the ridge. That gets full sun. I miss bleach. I put green bows on this signal fire today, but there's really no answering of smoke. I'm more worried about Ira than I am about Bill. It was Bill who found this trail to begin with. He always finds his way. September 9th. Bill came back today. He took his time coming through the trees, and I got scared, I almost fired my gun. But he clapped, and I clapped back, and he called out to say he was injured. It was the loose shale on the hill between the camp and the cave where Lillian was killed. He got caught in a slide and wound up buried up to his hips, and one foot wedged between boulders. He couldn't get free until the rocks shifted again, which they did that night when a whistler came by. He sure didn't see him. He had to spend two days convalescing within sight of Lillian's cave before he was well enough to hike back. Two nights alone out there. I bowled water while I listened to his story and gave Bill some aspirin from the dead man's backpack. His foot needed to be wrapped, but I don't think it's broken. We should stop splitting up, I said. He nodded and pushed his pack towards me. There was salmon and berries and some mushrooms I didn't really trust. We should think about hiking out, he said. Pick a direction and go. It's been four weeks. We'll only get weaker. When Ira comes back, I agreed but Bill pursed his lips like there was something he couldn't say. What? But he shook his head. It's been 10 days now since Ira left. September 11th. I woke up this morning to the sound that I thought was a whistler, but it was actually Bill on his knees crying at Gary Law's grave. I yelled at him about it, about waking me up and making so much noise. He looked hurt and I felt bad. I'm just worried about Ira, I think, and afraid. I don't know what we'll do when the weather starts getting colder. If we wait too much longer, hiking out won't be an option. There hasn't been any sign of rescue, no planes, no helicopters, no smoke, no sounds, but wolf howls and the distant whistling, like elk mating calls almost. If Ira were here, he'd tell us a story to get our minds off things. He's a registered nurse, he doesn't panic. September 12th, I apologized to Bill last night. He shook his head like it was nothing, so I put my hands on his shoulders and apologized again, because I needed him to really hear it. Well, I'm sorry you were alone, he said. We should have never left you alone. He was looking into my eyes so sadly, and I imagine he was remembering all the awful things of the past weeks. The feeling, the same guilt that I felt. 
It was our research that brought everyone here. Our reckless curiosity was to blame. Then he kissed me and kept kissing me. We undressed each other and had sex in the tent. I don't know why. I had never cheated on Ira before. Never even thought about it. This didn't seem wrong in the moment, but now it was difficult to write down. It just felt like something we both needed. We didn't say anything at all. Afterwards, he went outside to sleep by the fire. He spent this morning hauling water and wood. I don't think it'll happen again. I don't think either of us will tell Ira. September 15th. It's late. We hear whistlers just north of us. A chorus of them. Bill says he hears eight distant tones. But I don't know. It could be dozens. We put the fires out and now we're crouched in the tent with knives and a gun. Bill reaches for me, puts himself between me and the sound when it crescendos. I don't think he knows why he does it. I don't think it would really make a difference. We won't be sleeping tonight. September 21st. Ira is back. His coat is in tatters. His hat is gone. He isn't speaking. I would have to call it shock, but he's the only one with medical training, and I don't really know what to make of him. He walks and moves fine. He doesn't really look at me. doesn't seem to see me. I feel so guilty. I'm the reason he's out here. Now every time I look up, I find Bill staring at me. He tries to communicate with looks, but all I ever make out is fear and shame. Ira won't eat. We zipped him into a dead man's jacket and left him to sleep, but he's been shaking and mumbling all afternoon. He seems exhausted, but he hardly closes his eyes. It's my fault. September 26. Ira hasn't improved much. Although he is sleeping now and eating some, I've only seen him sick once before, food poisoning on our honeymoon. He was stoic about it and didn't want my help. Now he hasn't got much choice. I walked about a mile north and shot a porcupine, and Bill is setting up an Adler smoker so we can save the meat. He's getting very serious about us hiking out, but I'm not sure how we'll manage it with Ira so sick. He made it back here, didn't he? Bill said. He'll snap out of it. Maybe so. Neither of us has speculated about what Ira saw. All we know is he was on the south side of the mountain. Bill has proposed that we go west as far as the river, then follow it south. If he's right about it, and he's right about where he thinks we are, We'll hit Red Hill before it starts to snow. There's a lodge there and a few permanent residents, or so a helicopter pilot said. If anyone is looking for us, they'll certainly ask around Red Hill. I'm glad we have meat now. I've been feeling pretty weak. September 30th. Ira is recovering and not a moment too soon. I woke up this morning with his arms around me and the look in his eyes said he knew where he was, who I was, and was bursting with something he wanted to say but couldn't. It's okay, I told him. Be patient with yourself. We had a cold snap last night and it left frost on the ground. All three of us cuddled together to sleep, Ira between Bill and I. And at one point, Bill reached over to grab my shoulder. I think we're done with the awkwardness. I think we both know we were just scared. We don't have anywhere near enough food for this journey, but we're leaving tomorrow anyways. Bill has a cold. Hi all. I'm glad so many of you shared my enthusiasm about the first few entries. Though my enthusiasm has since twisted into something else. Yesterday in the comments, I mentioned that I felt lucky for finding these pages at the estate cell. I don't really feel lucky anymore. I feel guilty. This is going to sound crazy, but the more I read and transcribe, the more anxious I feel about the pages and the woman who wrote them. Her name is Ruth. That comes out in tonight's excerpt. I still don't really know much about her. I have no leads to share about the young woman at the estate cell or her grandmother. Yet I feel like Ruth is close. Like she's aware of what I've done. Like she's angry. I can't explain it. It's as if I can hear her, whispers of disappointment rising along with my own pulse. I'm certain now that she never meant her words to be used this way, to be posted online with little to no context, offered up as entertainment. I didn't sleep well last night. Still, I feel like we've started something now that needs to be finished. A few of you expressed interest in seeing Ruth's original pages, but I think that's where I should draw the line. It's where I can redeem myself. I'm uncomfortable with the idea of photographing the original documents in her original words and turning them into another memento for the internet to have its way with it. At this point, it makes no difference to me if you believe me or not. I guess that might seem selfish, but you can't hear her like I can. Anyway, here's the rest of what I've transcribed so far. October 3rd. Third day of walking. I wish I could talk to Lillian about what happened with Bill. She was young, ambitious, so funny. Plus, she had a whole horde of birth control pills. She and Jeff were dating. I forget how many you take in emergencies and how soon it has to be, but the pills are in her pack, and her pack is in that cave with the whistlers or whatever's left of her. She had the maps. She had everything that mattered. The cave is miles behind us now. We built a big cairn by the stream. 
At some point, we'll have to leave the Rangers out here, I'm sure. They'll want to collect Lillian and Jeff and the helicopter pilot. I can't remember his name. I hope one of us makes it out so his family can hear that it wasn't his fault. He had three daughters and was expecting a fourth. I can't imagine what his wife is doing now. If anyone finds this, it was an electrical malfunction. He got us to the ground safe and sound. He was perfect. He even fixed the problem. But then the weather closed in and we couldn't take off. Lillian knew the way, so we hiked to the lighthouse. And then the whistlers came. October 10th. It has rained for two days. The dead man's jacket is nowhere near warm enough for Ira and too big. But we don't have anything else. At least it's waterproof. We hear whistlers every night now, just after sunset. Three or four of them, calling back and forth. Bill is convinced that they're tracking us. We stack rocks high around the fire. We're following a new game trail now, instead of the river. The walking is easier. I didn't think twice about it until last night. Bill leaned forward on his elbows at the fireside while the whistlers seemed to be circling us. What if this isn't a game trail, he said, his voice in a low murmur. What if they made this? I don't have the energy to think about that. It's simple. If we're walking a trail they made, if their nightly whooping is urging us into a trap, we're fucked. Ira curls up into a ball and the whistlers start calling. He writhes like someone is sticking him with pins. All he said so far is, let's go. October 14th. It hailed today hard. We had to take shelter under a tree, and when dark fell, there were no whistles for the first time in a week. The silence was somehow more eerie than the threat of the whistlers. Ira felt it too, because about 15 minutes after dark, he stood up and started whooping and whistling out into the rain. Calling and screaming in a tone that didn't sound like him. Bill yelled at him to be quiet, but he acted as if he was possessed calling out to them at the top of his lungs with his eyes rolling back into his head. Bill tackled him to the ground and beat him to shut up. Stop it, I said, at first. But when Ira didn't stop making the noise, Bill looked at me and I closed my eyes and nodded. He had to knock Ira out cold to get him to be quiet. And he was sobbing while he did it, pleading with Ira to settle down. The wind was sharp. I think it saved us. Every tree was vibrating and creaking and howling. The Whistlers had likely all retreated to their caves. Maybe they hibernate. Maybe they'll leave us alone soon. October 17th. Ira was his old self this morning, as if he had completely gone backwards in time. He was up before either of us, heating water. He said he took so long to recon the south side of the mountain because the Whistlers caught him in a trap. It was a hole clearly dug with tools, he said, shaking while he spoke. They only came at night. I didn't get a good look at them. I could hear them. I could see their silhouettes, but nothing definite. It was too dark. I don't know what they wanted with me. I got out. I climbed out. And then I ran. We're well away from there now, finally reaching the end of the ridges and the start of a valley where everything is green. I hope the change in biome means a decrease in the Whistler population. Part of me wants to take steps to document as such, if it's true, but all of our field notes were lost with Lillian's gear, plus the night vision goggles and the cameras. My biggest fear is that we'll all be killed and our disappearance will inspire some other young researchers to come up here to solve the mystery for themselves. We'll become just another line in the sick folklore that draws people to this cursed place. I would hate to be part of that cycle. Knowing what I know now, the whistlers are very real and they don't want us here. November 1st. I dreamed last night that I was pregnant with Gary Law's baby. Nothing else happened in the dream. I was hiking endlessly with Ira and Bill and all three of us knew that I had been with the dead man and it bothered us, but we wouldn't talk about it. I woke up with my period, thank God. I've never been so happy doing laundry. We made a camp by a small lake in the low point of the valley. It's uphill from here to the distant saddle Ira thinks he remembers seeing from the air. It's only about two miles away. Red Hill should be just beyond that. Ira says we don't have the energy to push that far just yet. We'll rest today and tomorrow we'll move, and hopefully we'll be drinking beer at Red Hill Lodge before dark. Ira is the best shot, so he took the gun to look for more termigan. We lit two fires and agreed just not to go beyond the shouting distance, but I still worry. The Whistlers don't seem willing to attack when we're in a group. Lillian and Jeff were both alone when they were killed. Besides, I'm not convinced Ira is fully recovered yet. He says nonsensical things in his sleep, cries out and scratches. That's new. Bill and I went fishing after the laundry was done. It was stupid doing it in that order. All we caught were minnows, and even that took hours. He was staring at me while we sat. The cold was seeping into my bones, making me irritable. I hadn't been warm in weeks. What? I said. He's not himself. You know it. He meant Ira. He's better than he was. He's okay. 
We'll find him a doctor at Red Hill. What if Red Hill isn't on the other side of that saddle? What if we get up there and we're facing another week's worth of empty forest? What then? I realized my eyes were closed. I opened them and the lake seemed oddly bright. Bill's fingers were pressed against his brow. We'll worry about that when we have to, I said. I'm saying, I don't trust him like this, Ruth. He doesn't remember the other night after the hail. He can't control himself, he flexed his hands. He could get us killed. He's my husband, I said. Yeah, well, he's my brother, Bill replied. I nodded, but that was all I could do. I have known Bill longer than I have known Ira, and spent more time with him most days, at least back at home, since we both worked in the same department. He introduced me to Ira at a Christmas party six years ago now. What should we do, I asked. I don't know, but I think we may need to be open to the idea of cutting the rope at some point if he gets any worse. It may come to that. Bill started rock climbing on the weekends in college. Cutting the rope is a metaphor for letting Ira die so we can live. November 2nd. Yesterday while Ira was still out hunting, we heard three shots in the woods. Too many to just take down a ptarmigan. And Bill and I stood, staring, tense, for just a moment before we hurried to put out the fires and pack up what we could into our bags. Ira came running into the camp, breathing so hard, but he couldn't say what was wrong. He had no gun and no bag, and he grabbed my arm as soon as he was close enough and pulled me through the grass, up the valley, towards the saddle. Bill looked alarmed. He caught up to us and pried us apart. He yelled at Ira and handed me my haphazardly stuffed pack. All our clothes were still wet, torn from the line, and Ira's eyes were wild. He stared off behind us, towards the woods he'd run from. It's a warning, he said. I understand it now. It's a warning. Bill tried to talk him down, but then we heard the whistler's eerily musical voices. I've never heard it during the daylight, and never as close as this. I followed Ira's gazes into the trees and stared and listened. I couldn't move my legs. I couldn't even draw a breath. I held onto my pack straps, but with a stony grip, like it was attached to a balloon that might whisk me out of harm's way at any moment. Ira took my arm again, and Bill was helping him, pushing me along the trail until I could run until we were all running as fast as we could. The trail led straight into the open, and we all reacted differently, ducking through the Adlers and sweeping wide from the trail to be closer to the cover of the hemlock. Ira took the shortest path, straight through the matted grass and the game trail, and soon he was far ahead of me. And it was all I could do to keep my eyes on him and my legs moving as fast as they would go. He was the first to reach the hill covered in scrub, the saddle between two jagged peaks. He ducked low as he ran, and I lost sight of him. Bill's bad foot and pack slowed him down, and I saw him crouch wide-eyed beneath the trees. After we'd been fleeing for ten minutes, that felt like fleeting seconds. Ira's vanishing sent panic straight into my toes. It took me no time to decide not to wait with Bill. I had to catch Ira. I kept running until I reached the ridge, my lungs burning. Once I arrived, there was no sight of him, no trail to follow. I lumbered to the crest of the saddle, frantically clapping. Looking over my shoulder for Bill, who was also gone. From so high up, I could see the forest beyond, and the river, and a flat brown bay at low tide. No town. No red hill. I clapped, but neither of them clapped back. I was so exposed, but the whistling was distant now, and the fact that I couldn't pick it apart from the wind with any certainty. I walked closer to the trees and built two fires with my flint steel and shaking hands. The second in the open of the hilltop, big and smoky. The hemlock makes for thick cover. There was plenty of dry tinder. We left the tent behind, and the sleeping pads. Bill had the stove and the cooking pots. Ira had the gun. I have a hatchet and flint steel, as well as the wet laundry. I made a lean-to with a small roof of boughs, and sat through the evening with my back tense against the thick trees, and waited, and slept fitfully. I did the same today. I kept the fires alive, and now it's getting dark. I should walk back down to the valley to collect the tent, but the sound of the daytime whistle stuck in me like a splinter. I can't face the creature that made that sound, even after years of looking into it. I never believe the stories, not really. We came here to research the folklore, to listen to the elderly trappers and hunters tell their outlandish stories that they grew up with, to record them for posterity. We should never have come here. No sign of Ira or Bill. November 3rd. The rain came through my pine shelter last night, but at least I can say it broke me out of my trance. I tightened my hip belt on my pack, added a few hours of wood to both fires, unsheathed my knife, and then taped it to my hand. Bill told me to do this not long ago, if I knew I might have to run and fight at the same time. I'm walking back north, towards a place where I saw him fall, towards the place where the whistlers surprised us. Whistlers aren't the only thing to worry about in these woods. There are bears, wolves, coyotes, fearless predators that encircle our warm camp at night. Conventional wisdom is to make the most noise when passing through denser growth. Avoid surprising a carnivore. 
Yet I have long suspected that noise lures the whistlers. Prey species don't announce themselves. They pass in stealth. After what happened to Lillian and Jeff, and recently Ira, I have no doubt that we are prey. I resolve to go quietly along the margin of the hemlock. Keeping the game trail to my right, the signal fire smokes squarely at my back, and I walked carefully, keeping low, and whispering for Bill whenever the wind slowed. Pausing sometimes to listen hard after nearly an hour of creeping and murmuring fruitlessly through the trees, I lost my caution. God damn it, Bill! I shrieked, and seconds later his clap came. Two shocks of sound. I clapped back, and he did too, and then I found him, damp and chilled to the bone, slumped against a tree of a tall spruce not 30 feet from where I'd yelled. The needles where he sat were soft and dry, and I sat down right beside him, overcome. I tore the tape off my hand and held his face with my palms. His eyes were alert, despite everything. Where are you hurt? He looked at his ankle, and it was still wrapped but swollen now, risen like bread dough. It must have been fractured all along, and our sprint across the valley was the final straw. He was quiet, but grimaced as I wrestled off the sock in the inadequate wrappings. I held his foot on my thigh, feeling the mess of swollen tissue, but there was a deep blue bruising all across the top of his foot. He took my hands before I could do anything more. Where is Ira? I smelled the smoke from your camp. I shook my head. I couldn't catch him. He didn't have a pack to weigh him down, and he's a fast runner to begin with. He was over the ridge before me, and once I got up there, he was gone. If he saw my smoke, he hasn't let on. He left you? He had no gear. I focused on the foot, knowing I would need something tight and sturdy to wrap it in if I had any hope of moving Bill up to my camp. I took Dead Man's blue wool socks from my feet. They were small for Bill and had worked like a compression bandage. I rolled both of them onto one foot, and there were tears coming down his face before I was done. I'm sorry, I whispered, but you're lucky. I don't think it's broken all the way through, just badly fractured. Ira would know. He stared at me after I said this, but I avoided his gaze. I cast about until I found a dry branch straight enough to make into a crutch. Bill is just over six feet tall, so it was awkward walking a mile uphill with half his body weight on my shoulder. I could see he was in tremendous pain, but we made the trek without stopping, and it wasn't until he had collapsed beneath my pine shelter that I paused to let myself wonder if I had pushed him too hard. It didn't matter now, I reasoned. We were as safe as we could hope to be. I fed him the last of the dead men's aspirin and elevated his foot. There was nothing else. No food and nothing to catch food with. I'll worry about that tomorrow. Tonight, it's all I can do to keep the roof intact and the fires burning. Ira will see the smoke, and he will come to us before Bill is ready to walk again. He will. He has to. November 6th. The swelling has gone down in Bill's ankle. I killed a bird, a grouse, by throwing rocks. That seems to be a new low. Rock throwing is part of a deeper tier of human desperation we should never have to access. While sitting immobile, Bill has made a bow. He'll use the bird feathers as arrow fletching, and maybe for fishing flies. We say the longest trail feather out for me to use as a quill, he said, in case my pen dies. We need to scout the area before we move again. I could hike to the top of the peaks, but I can't justify leaving Bill alone that long. Not that he's helpless, but the awful truth is, we're both down to the last of our endurance. If we get separated, if I wind up alone again, I don't think I'll have it in me to keep going. It's bothering Bill not knowing what happened to Ira. The whistlers were behind us. He was ahead, he keeps saying. If they were hunting, they would have caught me. So they weren't hunting. What did they want? Why didn't he stop? At night, we hear them in nearly every direction, but they keep their distance. They aren't circling closer like they usually do. It's as if they want us to know we're within their boundaries, trapped within their home turf. If we sleep, we sleep in shifts. November 10th. No news. The weather is dry, but much colder than last week. Winter is late and I worry that when the snow finally does come, it will fall all at once, burring us in any points of reference. I built a windbreak and improved our shelter, caught a rabbit, helped Bill bathe. I keep catching him putting weight on his foot, rushing things. No sign of Ira and not much sleep. November 12th. It snowed overnight. At last. Just as I predicted, it came in a big rush and a great dumping of powder and then a sunny morning. The signal fire on the hill was smothered, but Bill wouldn't let me go out to relight it. He would have seen it by now, he said, meaning Ira. Save the dry wood. He made a second crutch and uses both to humor me. He says he can't be idle anymore. It seems such a risk, I said, to move on in this weather with you hurt. If we stay here, we will die, he replied. He's talking about building a sled once the snow is thick enough. I can't listen. I'll take the boat to the top of the hill, scout our path, look for a game. November 13th. Nothing much to see from the high ridge yesterday. No snow has fallen yet around the bay, and it occurred to me that we might just follow the coastline south. We could set a new fire every day on the beach, leave it smoking. Maybe a plane will pass. Maybe Ira will see us from wherever he's hiding. 
Maybe the whistlers don't swim. Bill says we'll leave tomorrow. I keep asking, what about Ira? He shrugged and looked exhausted. Don't know which way he went. Don't know where to look. Don't know how he is. If we leave, we will never see him again. I started to cry and Bill walked away to the shelter and curled up like he was going to sleep. He turned his back to me. I looked out across the saddle in the valley and tried to keep my tears quiet. It was just dusk. No distant fires, no smoke. If he's nearby, he's cold. He's dying and I'm helpless. It's full dark now and for the first time in weeks, the whistlers haven't made a sound. November 14th. Bill woke me up at dawn. He had hot water and a scrap of rabbit for me. I'm saving the bones and the feet in a plastic bag. I don't know if they'll be any good for soup, but soon they may be all we have. He lifted my pack for me to put on and then put his hands on my shoulders. I'm sorry, he said. I don't know what else to do. I looked back at him, watched while he got his own pack and kicked snow and dirt over the fire embers. I thought of leaving a note for Ira to follow or some kind of sign, but the snow was falling again in pellets. Every trace of us will be obliterated soon. November 18th. The hiking has been easier since we got below the snow line, but the weather is following us. The coast is icing over. We're making good time, and I think we're both relieved to be off that game trail. Aside from mud and rough gravel, the terrain is much easier here along the beaches than it was up in the trees. It's been five nights now since we heard the whistlers. Maybe they don't like the cold, or maybe we finally left their natural range. Even the smallest hope is agony. We had some luck with fishing yesterday. An enormous trout was stuck in a low pond after the tide went out. Probably sick, probably already dying. We spent the whole day gorging on it and cutting strips to smoke. I found Ira's gold watch in my pack. I gave it to him for our second anniversary. He had a habit of taking it off whenever he worked with his hands. He must have stashed it in my bag to keep it safe. I asked Bill if he wanted to wear it, but he said no. There's no point in looking at the time, I guess. I buried it near a fire, built a cairn over the top, said some words like a funeral. Bill didn't say anything. I had to. I had to do something in order to keep moving. I don't feel certain Ira is dead, but I can't fathom what it means if he's out there and we're leaving him behind. The most horrible thought is that he's the reason the Whistlers are gone. Maybe he's leading them on a chase away from us, or maybe they were hunting and they caught him and their hunger is satisfied for now. Don't think like that, Bill says, but I know Ira is in his thoughts too. Bill is a folklorist like me, but that's not what drew him here. He wanted to see the Whistlers with his own eyes, like Lillian did. He wanted to document them, their habits, describe them as a species for science. Everything that's happened so far fits the stories, I said. Don't, Ruth. But I didn't stop, because he knows the stories even better than I do. He knows we're just like all the other characters now. Hunted, doomed, they pick groups apart, they separate people, they take their prey one at a time. You don't believe the stories, you never believe them. I opened my mouth, but the words were delayed. I believe we'll never see Ira again. We sleep a little bit apart despite the bitter cold. He's always up before I wake. Bill says he recognizes his coastline and there's a pinnacle to the east he calls Fanfone Point. I'd say we're eight days north of Red Hill if we stick to the coast. I'm not getting my hopes up. November 28th. Ten days since I wrote. It all blends together. This bit of shoreline looks just the same as what we saw days ago. The water just is flat and gray. If it weren't for Bill and the compass, I would assume that we were skirting a large lake, not an inlet of the Pacific Ocean. I would assume we were going in circles. We do have Fanfun Point to navigate by, and the stars. The weather has cleared, winter is hesitating again. I worry I'll never see the leaves of the trees again, or flowers opening up in a field of grass. I worked all the time. Ira and I didn't take a vacation last summer, I squandered so much. Some days Bill and I don't speak a word to each other, we stop walking. He assembles the shelter, I build the fire. He unpacks the food, I hang our damp clothes, we eat, we sleep, and in the morning we walk. December 1st. I saw Red Hill first. Our strip of shoreline was getting pretty rocky, so we went up into the stand of cedar and found a steep bear trail. We haven't heard whistlers in weeks, so we beat pots and shouted every few steps. And something about us using our voices made us giddy. Bill started singing a camp song I've never heard. Something from when he was a child, I guess. Full of rhymed bodily functions. He laughed while he sang it, laughed until tears rolled down his face. He had to stop to catch his breath, and I walked a short ways onward, because it seemed he needed a moment alone. It seemed like he was finally realizing what I realized when we left the camp near the saddle, that we had abandoned Ira to an unknown fate, that he might have died a preventable death because we were too scared and broken to search for him. I walked toward a break in the trees with Bill hyperventilating at my back and saw a straight line far away, and a clearing where lighter green grass vibrated amongst dark evergreen. We were on a bit of a ridge and could look down into the distant oiliness of a minuscule town, just a lump of weedy brush and granite rinsing out the marshy lowlands. Now I was crying. There was a water tower, a long split rail fence, 
Distantly, some low buildings and power lines were visible against the curtain of trees. I called to Bill, who ran up beside me and stopped and stared. He wrapped his arms around me in relief, squeezing me hard against his chest. I kissed him without thinking first, and he jerked his head away, exhaling shakily into the air, but not releasing me from his arms. I'm sorry, I said. I don't know how to, he began, but didn't finish. I eased myself out of his embrace and gestured for him to follow me down the hill. It started snowing. Darkness fell when we were still about a mile outside of Red Hill. The terrain was difficult, thorny, and muddy. I struggled with the dimming flashlight, focusing intently on my feet and the ground ahead. But Bill grabbed my arm as the moon was rising. He stopped me. Look, he said. I looked ahead to Red Hill. I could see the water tower clearly still, an armored dome high above everything. It was silhouetted against the sky. What? There are no lights. I blinked, searched, but of course he was right. As night fell, nothing had come to life in Red Hill. There were no porch lamps. No glowing windows, no blinking red beacon atop the water tower. The place looked abandoned, as still and dark as death. We can't stop here in the open, I said. Can you make it without your light on? My flashlight was nearly dead, and the moon was rising anyway. I switched it off, and we continued, not struggling as urgently as before. I was aware of the sound of my boots made on the soggy ground. Bill's voice dropped to a whisper and was thick with caution. We'll knock on the first door we come to, he said. We'll lead with the fact that our chopper went down. What do you think is wrong? What are you afraid of? I was terrified, but I wasn't sure why. I don't know, he said. The moon was directly overhead by the time we reached the split rail fence we had seen from the ridge. Caution and fatigue had made the final stretch of the journey seem endless. There were sounds in the woods, nearby, not whistlers, maybe wolves, but I was more concerned about people. Lillian had warned us about the residents this far out, in these isolated stretches of forest. The lighthouse keeper had held a rifle to her forehead once when she surprised him after a few weeks away. We passed through the split rail fence and walked across a flat expanse of dirt stuck with poles, tetherball poles. It was a schoolyard. There were no children to be seen, no people, no signs of life. I turned my light back on and Bill did the same. He had a headlamp brighter and whiter than my little incandescent torch and walked ahead of me through the yard up towards the chain swing set and a few low buildings that looked like houses. The street between them was hard dirt scattered with rough quartz gravel that glittered in the light. He was bold. He walked up to a low porch of the first house that we leveled with and rapped sharply on the front door. Did anyone home? He called. Our helicopter went down and we need help. All was silent. I looked around while he stared at the door, hoping the noise might draw movement elsewhere in Red Hill. No luck. We went from house to house, knocking and calling at eight buildings on the lonely street. We ended at the lodge, a sort of multi-purpose building that contained rooms for rent, a post office, and a meeting hall. It was deserted like the rest. My flashlight flickered and died while we stood on the front porch. Bill tested the handle and found that the lodge was unlocked. I can't see how anyone would object, he said, tipping his headlamp beam down towards looking at my face. We were both shivering. The pilot said, people lived here year-round. He must have been mistaken. Inside, Bill felt along the lodge's wall for a light switch, but there was no power. I found a full kerosene lamp on a bookshelf and a book of matches in an ashtray on a table in the lodge's dining area. I lit the lamp and breathed a little easier. Bill walked around the lodge's room with his headlamp, getting his bearings. But I sat at the table with the lamp, holding my head, trying to feel grateful for the shelter. He came back, wiping his hands on his pants. The breaker didn't do anything. There's a generator back in the utility room, but it looks like it's got a little fuel left, but I'll wait until morning to try it. When I didn't respond, he came and sat across the table from me. Abandoned or not, we're going to have to winter here. I nodded. We'll get our hands on a radio, as much food and fuel as we can find. We'll hole up and wait it out. Someone will come for us. I nodded again, but I couldn't look at him. All you need is rest, he said, softer now. He led me toward the bedrooms and opened a creaking door for me. The room had a double bed with a pretty cream-colored quilt, a closet with accordion doors, and a wide window that looked out into the blackness. Is there a room without a window? He looked at my reflection in the dark glass, then looked at the real me. I carried the kerosene lamp, and my unsteady grip cast eerie shadows. Of course, he said. He ushered me in the room directly across the hall. It was adjacent to a doorway that led away towards a lounge full of deer trophies and enormous television screens. It had skylights, and the moon was shining through. The bedroom was nearly identical to the first, except the bedspread was a blue patchwork, and the window was replaced with a hanging tapestry of sweet pea blossoms. I nodded, set my backpack down, and placed the lamp on top of the dresser so it cast light on each of the four walls. I unzipped my jacket, but Bill stayed in the doorway. I could take the room across the way. Don't be silly. He gave me a serious look, but put his pack down beside mine and got into bed with me. Suppose it's too cold to sleep apart, he said, taking off his boots and settling rigidly under the covers. Why is it different from sharing a tent? 
It just is. I thought I would fall away into the deepest sleep of my life, but the wind picked up, the lodge creaked and shuddered around us, and I thought every other sound was a footstep or a human whimper. At one point, I woke Bill up, dead certain I heard a baby crying. He struck my hair and listened to me for a full minute, then pressed me against the mattress by my shoulders before I lying back down himself. Back to sleep, he mumbled, but I didn't sleep. Instead, I took the kerosene lamp to the chair in the corner and wrote down this strange day. Bill is motionless in his sleep. One arm slung around beside him in the place I left. It is different. Just the two of us sharing a domestic space. What will become of us during the months of isolation? What will we look like to whoever finds us? I hear it again now. A wailing that is certainly not the wind. The doors are locked, but that's hardly any consolation. If the whistlers are real, what else could be living in this place? A banshee? Windigo? Or something even stranger? Bill sleeps through the sound. He won't believe me in the morning. December 2nd. I woke up in the chair where I fell asleep writing. The lamp's wick was low, and it had burned down far too much of the kerosene before snuffing itself out. There's a spare can, but it won't last long. I'll have to be more careful. Bill was gone when I awoke. He had covered me with a quilt from the bed. I found him in the lounge inspecting the mounted moose heads and elk skulls. There were books, field guides, and old almanacs scattered along the coffee table. The wood stove was blazing, ticking with heat, but Bill wasn't relaxed. He greeted me in a whisper and moved tentatively through the room. I had nearly forgotten about his injury. Let me have another look at your foot, I said. You should rest in bed for a few days now that we're safe. He shook his head. We're not safe. Come look. He led me through the lounge and onto the porch at the front of the lodge. There was no snow or ice on the ground outside, but the road is muddy. The ground is soft enough to hold indentations. From the porch steps, we saw the street and its quartz gravel. The small ruts we made from walking out from house to house in the dark last night. But now our steps are not the only marks on the road. There were other prints too. Evidence of pacing steps and sliding gashes where the gravel had been scraped away completely. It could have been tracks of dozens of pairs of feet, or just a few, going around and around the lodge while we slept. The footprints form an unbroken circle around us, evidence of stalking, pacing, night watch of the whistlers. They have retreated now, apparently, but how far? In the moment, I could scarcely breathe. I staggered back against the lodge's front door, my body crumpling and heavy. In the stories, the whistlers don't leave tracks, I whispered. Bill shrugged and kept his stoic face. They look human to me, like a grown man dragging his feet. His voice was low and tired. What's wrong with you? He shook his head. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if this is a game the whistlers are playing or if the people of Red Hill reappeared last night and made these marks to mess with us. It doesn't matter if it's aliens or mole people or fucking Lillian and Jeff back from the dead. We can't stay here now. He opened up the front door and nodded me back inside. We'll gather what we can and then keep moving south until we find another town. There's a closet with some gear, a good tent, tarps, lanterns, and a stove. If you start getting things together, I'll see if I can find a vehicle that runs. I stopped in the doorway. I was breathing so hard I could taste blood. No, we can't split up. We're no safer during the day than we are at night. We can't make that mistake a second time. He paused. Fine, I'll take what we need from the closet. You have a look at the food in the kitchen. Then we'll pack up and scout out a vehicle together. Agreed? I nodded, but I was not completely reconciled with Bill's plan. How long can we really run before the hunger stops us, or the cold, or the harsh unknowns of this landscape? We saw this region from the air, saw the dead-end logging roads, the ghost town surrounded by miles of wilderness. We both know that Red Hill has no outlet. The single road leads west to an airstrip and a dock that freezes over every January. The mail comes by boat, and only in the summer. Bill knows there actually is nowhere we can run. Maybe the whistlers know that too. One task at a time, food. I walked into the dining area, back beyond a buffet table waiting for chafing dishes, into the kitchen. It is thoroughly modern, with a wood veneer cabinet and a walk-in freezer with a gleaming door. Someone has put a lot of care into this kitchen. Perhaps they photographed it for brochures? Bear tours have become popular amongst the wealthy and well-armed. The cupboards are nearly bare, as one would expect them to be at the close of the season. There is a bin with a few cups of stale flour inside, a bottle of rancid oil, a gallon sized of fruit cocktail, a bunch of crumpled tea bags, a canister of powdered milk, a stuck together brick of sugar cubes. I opened the refrigerator, but the stagnant air behind the door poured over me, making me reel and gag before I forced it shut. I glimpsed molding vegetables, rancid meat, obscure plastic wrappings dotted with black mold. I must have gagged audibly because soon Bill was in the kitchen door, eyes wide and shining like he'd been sprinting. What's wrong, he said. The fridge is full of spoiled food. He frowned. That doesn't make sense. They would have cleaned everything out before closing this place up for the season. But it wasn't closed up, I said, my voice shaking. The front door was unlocked. The tables and chairs are still out. The TV cabinet in the lounge was wide open. 
The curtains weren't drawn in the bedrooms. Gas in the generator, he said, nodding. Nothing winterized, like they left in a hurry. The back of my throat had gone dry. I walked to the freezer and yanked against the long steel handle, preparing myself for another wave of pungent odor. But deciding that spoilage in the freezer could be the final piece of evidence that proved this emerging theory. That something had gone very wrong for the residents of Red Hill. Bill stood at my shoulder, watching with a wary hand over his nose and mouth as the door hinge creaked. Food on the shelves of the walk-in were actually better contained than what had been in the fridge. There was spoiled meat wrapped in paper, looking sunken and gory. The ice and the ice cream all melted within the confined containers, as if power outages were routine. Besides a deeply musty, almost rubbery smell at first, I thought the freezer, though abandoned, was benign. Ruth, Bill said behind me, his hand creeping shakily along my shoulder trying to turn me back towards him. What? And I looked squarely to the back of the freezer, where a pair of rounded shoes were visible behind a pallet stacked with sunken bags of frozen vegetables. The steel floor beneath the pallet was shiny with dried fluids that had leaked from the bags. Maybe days ago. Maybe weeks. Don't, he repeated. But I kept looking, following the shoes to a scrawny pair of legs, bent knees, the pleated black pants and white coat of the lodge's chef, a middle-aged woman with wiry white hair and a shriveled gray face. I took a step towards the dead woman, felt my bare feet sticking into the mess of the freezer's floor. Bill's grip tightened onto my shoulders. Look at me, he said. Look away. What happened here? I breathed. He pulled me away out of the kitchen, through the lounge, all the way back to the bedroom. Just as sleeping beside Bill is different out in the wilderness, so death is freshly strange within the confines of the lodge. The dead chef makes less sense to me than Gary Law or the lighthouse keeper. She died indoors, in a place where the beds were still made, where the refrigerator was filled with food. She should have been safe. Why would they leave her here, I said. He knelt at my feet with a bottle of water and a washcloth, scrubbing the freezer's sickness off them. I left my shoes at the front door ages ago, it seemed. When he spoke, his voice shook. What exactly did you hear last night? You woke me, you heard something. A baby. It sounded like a crying baby. The lighthouse keeper, he said he sometimes heard whistlers laughing, laughing like his parents in the reception hall after church on a Sunday. They'll get inside your head, they'll lure you in. You can't let them, Ruth. I was dazed and I couldn't speak, so Bill kept talking. I imagine they were already here, in Red Hill, before we arrived. Spooked the residents, the power must have failed already because she went in there. There was a parka on the hook outside, she didn't take it. Must have been a panic. She went in there to keep herself safe. Maybe people started leaving and she couldn't get out. It was all an accident, he said, rubbing my leg reassuringly. They didn't realize she was trapped. There's a bell, I said, an emergency alarm. Her fingers, Bill, her fingernails. They were scraped bloody on the door handle, pour up. So maybe there was no one left to hear the bell. Maybe everyone else. But I sat upright on the bed, I couldn't calm down. That night when it hailed, you would have done anything to make Ira quiet down. They got inside Ira's head, didn't they? Maybe they got inside hers too. You think our own people locked her in there? I tried to speak reasonably, tried for academic composure. There's a story, isn't there? One of the old ones. A story about people the whistlers don't kill. There's one in almost every group, every story. Someone susceptible who succumbs to a kind of madness, tearing at their own flesh, losing their minds, killing their companions. Lillian thought it was a sort of Stockholm Syndrome. Bill nodded. He told me the story of the family who lived at the outpost near the lighthouse. It had been years and years ago. Mother, father, three children... The father sent a dispatch one day to say that he had killed his wife and his kids, strangled them. He had received a warning, he said, so he killed them all. When the rangers arrived, the residence was empty. There was no sign of any of them, no sign of a struggle, as if they had vanished over the rocks and into the sea. Bill told me to lie down for the rest of the afternoon, but I couldn't. I'm ready to go, I said, and we wasted no time. We packed our bags in a mournful silence. I was greedy and overstuffed my pack, taking the quilt from the bed, spare batteries, candles, matches, mouthwash from the bathroom, and the remaining kerosene. Bill found a handgun in the locked drawer, plus ammunition. He had braved the freezer a second time, discovered that the drawer's keys was in the pocket of the chef's coat. She wrote something, he said, when he returned. There was a clipboard mounted on the inside of the freezer, an inventory log, and a pen. The chef had scrawled a desperate message on the blank backside of the page. I understand it now, after all these years, all these long winters of hearing those damn things howling out in the woods. The Whistlers stand with their backs to us. They stand between us and something terrible. They've been protecting us all these years, keeping it at bay. Whatever it is, they were warning us all this time, and now it's too late. Too late by far. It's come to Red Hill at last. I've copied it verbatim, and I can't stop thinking about it. You're right, Bill said, shaking his head once he finished the reading. He crumpled the page and left it on the table. Stockholm Syndrome. I was wrapping the end of the fireplace poker with duct tape, but slowed to look at Bill now. 
considering the chef's words. They caught Ira in a trap. Yes, he said. They didn't kill him, didn't hurt him. He was well enough to find his way back to us. He escaped them. But I don't want to hear it, Ruth. I nodded. I practiced swinging the poker against the fire logs. Even now, all we had to go on were other people's words. We came all this way to conduct our own research, and the only thing we've learned is fear. We hear the whistlers, but we have not seen them. We fear the unseen, but what if that's a failure of imagination? Perhaps there's something else to be afraid of. Some reason the stories are so few and scattered. Some reason there are really rarely any survivors. Some reason Bill and I have made it this far. Some unknown. We wrote a note and left it on the side table near the front door. Our names and date, contact numbers for our families back home, an apology that we didn't do more for the woman in the freezer, but we really couldn't spare the time or energy it would take to bury her. We put the kitchen parka on over my jacket and pants. Bill layered his clothes over Gary Law's. We took gentle steps away from the lodge. Across the barrier line of Whistler tracks, listening hard. In the light of the day, it was clear that Red Hill had been evacuated in a rush. There were split logs stockpiled beside every structure, potted plants dying out on porches, a garage door left open, its contents in disarray. Not many vehicles, Bill said, as we walked to the far side of Red Hill, out toward the skinny dirt road that led out of town. So this road must lead somewhere, I said, hopefully. They got in their cars and took this road out of town. Bill didn't seem encouraged. To a dock, to an airstrip maybe, I'm sure a town this size has emergency evac procedures. We could follow this road and end up at a dead end. Still, it's better than not knowing. It's better than planting our feet here and waiting to starve, or worse. He tugged on his coat and squinted against the bright white sky. We looked into the houses along the main street. Most front doors were left unlocked. One had keys stuck in the knob, dangling. We found a loaded revolver stashed under a mattress and a dog trapped inside a bear kitchen pantry. It was a mutt, shaggy, and pissed off. We opened the door, and it shot away into the woods, didn't look back. Even the brief scouting wore me out. Bill kept looking over his shoulder, tightening his grip on his gun, and staring around at every sound. My shoulders were aching under the pull of my pack straps. At last, we found two worthy vehicles, each with slightly less than half a tank of gas. One a smallish van, and the other a jeep with stud tires and the keys sitting on the dash. Bill leaned his hands on the jeep as if it meant we were saved, but I stood apart, unable to shake a sick feeling in the conundrum of the chef's final words. What if we don't leave, I said. You said yourself, there's nothing certain at the end of that road. We could drive to the coast and get stranded. We could end up on foot again, in the woods exposed. We're exposed here, did you not see those tracks? I did. They surrounded us last night, they were everywhere, and yet here we are, standing in the street, alive. For months, the whistlers have been on top of us, but we're still breathing. Tell that to Lillian and Jeff. Tell that to Ira, he was yelling now, panting. Our faces were red and close. I was blinking away tears, but I wasn't upset, just overwhelmed. One more night indoors, I bargained. Let me wash, be warm, just one more time. I'm so tired, Bill. So tired. He didn't agree, not explicitly. While we stood there with the jeep, it started snowing, just the lightest veil falling between us. We returned to the lodge. He moved around with a sort of quiet, powerless violence, locking and barricading the doors, drawing curtains, checking and rechecking the guns. We parked the jeep in front of the lodge and loaded the back seat with gear and tools as if to remind me that our present comfort was necessarily temporary. We dragged the bed to the lounge, close to the stove. We moved the lounge's couches and tables towards the windows, then made the bed, almost reflexively, shaking the quilt out between us and draping it over the neaten sheets. Night was falling by then. We're getting out of here at first light, Bill informed me. I'm gonna go boil a kettle and take a bath, I said. He softened just a little. I saw towels in the closet. The water pressure is low, but the faucets still work. Drawing from the water tower, I assume. I only needed a few inches of cold water anyways. I didn't want to dilute the heat. I was eager to be cleansed from the dead chef and Gary Law and even Ira. Eager to get the smell of the forest off my skin and start forgetting the things we'd done to stay alive. I took my hair down while the water dribbled into the tub. It had grown long and had coalesced into oily tendrils since the last time I washed it. There were split ends and strands of gray. Ira always liked it long. I thought about cutting it off with a pocket knife. I thought of how light and unencumbered I would feel once the oily heft of it was gone. I think about getting clean the way I think about eating and drinking. It's a need. Can't imagine anyone taking it for granted. It feels like it may never be completely satisfied. I hadn't added the hot water yet when I was interrupted by the sound of Bill barreling through the hallway. He opened the bathroom door, saw me halfway undressed with my hair down, and closed it abruptly. He spoke through the door in a rush. It's them. We're away from the windows and in the front hallway, listening to them. 
The howl, high-pitched, nasally, throaty, it's often hard to define. The terror is not just something I remember and have learned to feel, but innate. The experience, the fear of the sound on some deep unconscious level. It is a warning, clicked into the deepest part of my mammalian brain. Danger. Bill held the fire poker and both guns. Then he gave me a choice. I took the revolver, only four bullets left in the cylinder. He took the handgun in its full clip. He rested the poker and the hatchet against the wall and stood behind me near the doorway pressing his body against my back, his mouth, to my ear. There's at least four of them, he murmured. Close enough I could hear footsteps. The sound came from every direction. The whistlers were like carn whore blasts. So loud, the tendons in our necks tensed. Porch steps creaked, but our angle was awkward. I could barely see the front windows from where we cowered, and the low lights from the stove and electric lanterns barely reached the door. We could go through the kitchen exit, he whispered in between hard breaths, to the furthest cabin. No lights. Run for it. It was a fine plan. The whistlers might be attracted to the light and heat of the stove and the lanterns. They might not notice us slipping away. Yet that moment, I didn't have it in me to flee again. If they drove us from the lodge, who was to say they wouldn't drive us from the cabin and then back into the woods? We couldn't survive being out there again. Not in the looming snow, not just the two of us. I thought about the wash line and tents we abandoned the day we lost Ira. And how our flight across the valley had cost us. No, I said, not again. I charged away from Bill straight towards the front door where the whistlers murmured. I threw open the door despite Bill's warning cry and saw only one figure beyond it, a dark, lanky shape on the bottom step swaying listlessly, skeletal shoulders hunched beneath the head of a shaggy hair. I was blinded by fear and I raised the gun as I stepped out onto the porch. I fired. I saw his face in a flash, a swollen lower limp, empty eyes, hair clinging wetly to a fevered forehead. He fell like the wind had blown him down, instantly dead. And a moment later, I was with him, laying my body on top of his, crying against his face and asking for forgiveness. I couldn't hear anything, but Bill told me later that there was no whistles, no sign of them, just Ira. Just his blood and footprints on the walkway and steps. Bill carried us inside, first me, then his brother. He lay Ira on the floor and I lay down with him, pressing my face to the stone quiet chest while his warmth ebbed away, asking him weeks worth of questions whose answers we could never know. December 5th, Bill left me there with Ira that night. He shuts the door of the lounge and slept in the bed alone. I have kept Ira's body for three days, trying to comprehend it. His right arm is missing, worn away. The wound crudely cauterized somehow, but deeply infected. He was barefoot, feet frostbitten, his eyes riddled with broken vessels, hair missing in patches. The nails of his hand had grown and worn like claws. He wouldn't have survived the night, Bill keeps saying. Don't blame yourself. I shaved Ira's face, but it didn't help. Didn't make him look any more human. I could hardly see him anyways, through all the tears. The moment you opened the door, it stopped, Bill said. I'm sorry, I said. Are you listening? The whistling. It stopped all at once. I didn't see any of them out there. I didn't see anything but you and him. I saw his face, I said. It's all I saw. The prince circled the cabin and Ira walked amongst them. We know that much. Since that night, we haven't heard any whistlers, not once. December 7th. Bill dug Ira's grave today. It snowed hard the night before and the topmost crust of soil was frozen. Digging was punishing work. It took hours. I thought we were desensitized to death, but I found him sitting on the edge of the hole when it was done, his legs dangling down, sobbing into his hands. I didn't know what to do, so I sat beside him. Ira was still inside the lodge, rolled in a pale yellow sheet, wrapped up so we couldn't see his face. We sat there together for a long time, both of us pretending we were safe and he was alive and the hole was anything other than a grave. I felt the cold in my joints like shards of glass. Why don't we lie down with him, Bill said meaning down in the hole. I struck the back of his head. I couldn't think of a good answer. It seemed to me we'd been offered plenty of chances to die and decline them until now. I looked into the dark hole whose bottom was settling with tiny snowflakes that didn't last. The snow would fill the grave over us, eventually, preserve our bodies from the whistlers until the residents of Red Hill came back at the start of the dry season. I've heard freezing is a gentle death, like falling asleep. Bill left my side and carried Ira's body to the grave, hefted him down, and then came up again, standing and pulling me up beside him, taking me away. I'm sorry, he said, though I hadn't still spoken a word. Don't listen to me. Simmer night. We had a baby, Ira and I, five years ago today. She was born with a heart defect and didn't live long. Didn't ever leave the hospital. I have scars. Her name was Catherine. Ira left town before the funeral, went to a medical conference two states away, but Bill was there. He got drunk and cornered me in his mother's living room. She should have been mine, he said. So close I could smell the whiskey. That's why Bill doesn't believe me when I say I hear the infant's cries in the wind. He knows it's Catherine's birthday. He thinks about her too. I hear her wailing in the evening often, just before the whistlers start to howl. An overture prelude. We're out of food. Each night we build a fire in the stove and sit before it with shaking hands, with cups of tea. There is snow on the ground, snow to reveal that the whistlers haven't circled close since Ira has died. There are no tracks but our own. 
I've started asking myself the question in practical terms. If I have some choice in the matter, how would I like to die? Would I choose to go as Catherine did, swaddled and sedated in my mother's arms? There was a time when I thought I wanted to die fighting, my knife in my hand, knuckles red from the cold. Not so sure anymore. I'm not sure if I have the patience for that. Everything is different since I buried Ira. The difference in between us, yes, in the atmosphere of Red Hill. Bill doesn't bustle around the way he used to, doesn't sit vigil at the windows and watch the distant trees. There is something we've discovered beyond fear. A separate emotion, a detachment. All that matters is the heat of the fire, the weight of the blankets. We hardly speak anymore. December 13th. Bill leaves the lodge every afternoon now to go look for food. He says he wants to go alone and I don't argue. He makes a few good finds, popcorn, instant coffee, noodles, dried parsley, half a bottle of bad gin. Each day he circles a little further out, stays away a little later. Last night he didn't come back until an hour after dark. Until I had already really heard the mournful chorus of two whistlers far away in the woods. I thought about walking out to them in my desolation. I want to see their faces. I want to know my tormentors. When I try to envision them now, all I see is Ira. Ira at the end, his gaunt face and yellowed eyes. Do they suffer as he suffered? Would I recognize their faces? When Bill came back, he pressed a pack of chewing gum into my palm and went straight to bed. He was limping on his bad foot. He had walked too far. Why were you out so long, I asked. But he rolled over against the pillow, pretended not to hear. December 15th. There are about six inches of snow on the ground. I spent the day stacking firewood on the porch, but Bill stayed close, at my insistence, and wandered through town like a tiger in a small cage. There is nothing left to eat at Red Hill. And no game nearby. Nothing but coyotes and wolves. In the early evening, he walked across the road with a gas can, siphoned fuel from the van, which is parked outside the gray house just up the street. I watched him from the front porch. He looked up from his work to look back at me to meet my gaze through the falling snow. We might go to the coast after all. For all I know, there's a radio out there, a phone, some means of contact we've overlooked. Maybe the Coast Guard will send a patrol. Maybe someone has been looking for us all this time. Bill stopped staring. His head turned suddenly towards the wood behind the house. He'd heard something, a snapping of twigs. What is it? I called, but he didn't answer. He walked a few steps towards the woods, craned his head, and then a streak of brown and black emerged through the trees and went straight for him. There was a deep growl, a scuffle of motion, and Bill's strangled cry. A dog. The dog we'd released from the pantry a few days before. I sprang from the porch with a stick of firewood in my hands, but it was too late. Bill had slipped on the ice and fallen hard against the edge of a van's bumper. The dog tore into his leg, but released it as Bill fell, and then lunged for his face. I swung the splintered edge of the firewood squarely at the poor beast's skull. He was like us, starving, a skittish mutt made savage by the cold. Bill was dazed, scraping for purchase in the snow behind me, trying in vain to stand. The dog cowered away from me, and it seemed cruel to swing a second time, so I screamed instead. At the top of my lungs, shouted at the dog to run, and he did. He turned, he lowered his body, and went slowly towards the woods close by, cowering deeper like he didn't want to go back into the trees. But I was full of adrenaline now and yelled a second time, so loud that my voice echoed off the houses, and something answered me. It was a strange roar, a rumble like a rock slide mixed with an animal scream like a panther. I came out of the woods where I had driven the dog, and now I heard the mutt whimpering. The screaming and the whimpering and Bill's muddled murmuring behind me, and I found myself backing towards him through the snow almost senselessly until a new sound erupted and overcame the others, the whistlers. Their voices rose, familiar now, surrounded us until I couldn't hear the shrieking roar, the whimpering dog, couldn't hear Bill's exhausted breathing or my own heart. I turned suddenly focused and grabbed his hand. He had been holding his pistol, aiming it unsteadily towards the woods. I took it now and heaved him upright. He was woozy, bleeding freely into the snow. Gary Law's khaki pant leg was soaked red. There was blood on his head too, a scrape from a bolt on the van's bumper. Not deep. His eyes were half closed. Stay awake, I said grabbing Bill's chin more roughly than I meant to, yanking him towards the lodge. The whistler's cries were harrowing but helpful now. They seemed to propel us onward, made us focus on the fear and the imperative of flight. The dog had bitten Bill's bad leg, the one already weakened by his twisted ankle. He could walk, but he was shaking. I helped him across the street and helped him up the porch and into the lodge's dining area. He collapsed into a chair, leaned his body against the table. He was grimacing horribly and we were losing daylight fast. I cut away his pant leg with my knife. You're going to need stitches, I said. Dog's bite was an arc puncture wounds with deep gashes torn near the shin. The wound on his head was bloody, but not horribly deep. Not as bad as it looked. A scrape only, a shock. And now the blood was seeping slower. I set an electric lantern on the table, but still wasn't able to get enough light. Headlamps in the lounge, he said. When I went for it, I remembered the cheap bottle of gin. 
Find it, Bill called to me. There was pain in his voice. I made myself hurry. There was alcohol hand sanitizer in my pack and a spool of surgical silt with steel needles. Ira had put the first aid kit together with his own skill set in mind. I poured water on the wounds, washed the blood away, and watched more take its place. Are you okay? He asked. I don't know what I'm doing. I wiped hand sanitizer on the needle and then doused the gash with his leg on it. He reeled where he sat as the alcohol had burned. I'm sorry. He shook his head. You're doing fine. I handed him the gin bottle before I started stitching. It was half full and Bill took a grateful swig before nodding at me to get on with it. The skin was harder to pierce than I expected, but Bill seemed to be able to center himself amid the pain. He closed his eyes and only grunted a little at each time I pulled the thread through. He kept saying it was okay, that I was doing fine. Finally, I tied off the thread and taped a squared piece of gauze over my work. I sat at the table afterwards, sweating inexplicably, exhausted, feeling there was more I should do, replaying the noises in my head, the sequence of events, the whistlers, and the thing that had answered my shouts. Bill walking towards the woods, the sound, the dog. What came first? It was jumbled already. The memory? I had recorded it here as a way to make the most sense. The moon was rising and we leaned into each other, both of us looking away at the deepening shadows, looking through the windows for signs of life, finding the night remarkably horribly quiet. He drank from my gin bottle again and then handed it to me. It was harsh and cheap, but I took more than one burning gulp. Suppose a dog was running from it, Bill asked. I shrugged, but something dreadful was welling up inside me. I stood up and turned in a useless circle and felt hot tears falling. I felt the desperation and spoiled hopes of the past weeks rolling over me. I was collapsing. I leaned towards the table to steady myself, but Bill caught me before I could. He stood and held me against his chest, one easy movement. One hand against the back of my head, he was breathing in the same uncontrolled gasps that had overtaken him on the trail before we saw Red Hill. When he was balancing between despair and a kind of jovial release, he pulled my hair down, smoothing it between his hands, so I tipped my head back so I had no choice to look up at him. My vision cleared, the tears stopped, and then we were breathing together, our eyes locked, and our bodies reacting like two leaves tugged down by the same current. December 17th. Bill was pale the next morning, weak, but we couldn't stay in bed when I asked him to. He hobbled around the lodge, gathering more gear, hauling it out to the jeep, dragging the gas can up from where we had abandoned it in the road. I made some broth, but he wouldn't eat. In the afternoon, we walked away towards the woods, toward the place where the dog ran and the roar sounded. We walked towards the trees and stopped and stared, and then I hollered from the front porch. He didn't look back at me. I tried to follow to fetch him, but it seemed he didn't limping. He took two steps onward for every one of mine. He went on until he was in the trees, out of sight, and as much as I wanted to, I couldn't make myself follow. I stood in the frozen road and shouted for him, but I didn't have it in me to enter the woods. I lay in bed throughout the night with eyes open, hearing the whistlers, soft, far away like a lullaby. I heard Catherine on the wind, the tears come much easier when I'm alone. I found him this morning, sitting on the front porch steps, facing out, with ice in his beard. I touched his neck and held his arm. He seemed alert. He looked into my eyes. What happened to you? I was nearly crying, but he didn't respond. He just rubbed my arm and led me back inside, as he continued to watch me through saddened eyes. Later, once he was warm, he said he had gone to the woods to listen to the whistlers. He said he could understand them now. Don't say that, Bill. I cried into his shoulder, pressing my fingers to his lips. But he was calm. It's okay, Ruth. Go to the coast tomorrow and you'll be safe. We'll be safe, I said. He nodded and held me tighter. December 18th. It was sad, pulling out of Red Hill, watching it shrink behind us until it was closed off by a ridge of granite and a curtain of trees. It felt momentous, almost like it was the beginning of our journey again, like we were grad students, me and my love of reading, and him with his lust for the outdoors. I had married his brother, and he always wanted to get closer. One late night in the office grading papers, we had a crazy idea. I wrote the grant application, he planned the logistics. Ira took a sabbatical, volunteered. I met Lillian at a conference. All we saw was our interests aligned. We went out for a few drinks, the whole group, and together, we talked about how much fun it would be. We were barely in the Jeep for 40 minutes before we ran out of road. Our path terminated into a wide lot of pale brown gravel. There was no airstrip, just a rotted lot with puddles that had turned to slush. A floating dock slick with ice and a boathouse with two broken canoes in it and a rusted hole in the roof. I was driving because Bill was ill. Leaning against the window, his leg hurts him. It's badly bruised and the scrape on his head isn't healing. He stared straight ahead. Once we parked, he stared through the windshield with tears forming in his eyes. I don't know what he was expecting. It was hard to see that we were at the edge of the earth now, out of options. You know, Bill said, sniffling and wiping his nose. In the olden days, people would... They would walk into the sea to kill themselves. There's something poetic about it. Not in real life, I suppose. I'd never seen anything poetic about a dead body. He reached for my hand across the gear shift. I'm not going back to Red Hill, Ruth. I can't. Not now. 
I can't look at Ira's grave again. I can't walk through the kitchen and pretend there isn't a corpse in the freezer. I can't. What else is there? He shook his head. There's the rub. I pulled my hand away and got out of the Jeep. It was impossible, holding my thoughts together. I wanted to stop struggling, but not to die. I wanted Bill to stop feeling pain, but not to be alone. I wanted to end both our suffering. I wish I had just said yes days ago, when Bill laid Ira in his grave and asked if we should lie down too. It was windy at the coast, so my cheeks burned. I walked down towards the dock, but couldn't go far without risking my footing on the ice. Bill was watching me from inside the jeep, waiting. I suppose to hear me say I was about ready to give up too, but I wasn't ready. I closed my eyes, felt the embrace of the wind, and the deep within the hush of it, I heard the cry again. My little Catherine's cry. And a voice. A man's voice. Ira singing to her. Bill got out of the jeep and looked towards the sound. Whistlers, he said. Is that what you hear? I walked toward it. Where are you going? Bill called. I waved that it was okay and I walked around the useless boathouse, up a low hill of sliding gravel. At the top, the wind was stronger, swirling with tiny snowflakes, and I could see more gray water up the coast. I could also see distant glimpses of shorelines segmented by trees and low surf, and a bobbing shape, white and blue, lodged against a spit of dark sand. I rushed back down the hill towards the jeep, sliding in the gravel, panting hard. What is it? Bill asked. There's a boat. Get your pack. It was impossible to take the jeep directly up the beach. There was too much loose gravel, too many jutting black rocks in our path. We had to wind in and out of the patches of forest and had to boost each other over boulders. Really, we had to trudge through the coarse sand as well. I was relentless, forcing myself onward, climbing every dune to confirm that the boat was still in sight. Still a small and blue and white catch with bare mass and enclosed cabin. The sound led me onward for a while and the sound of Ira and Catherine. The sound Bill kept pausing to warn me of. The sound he said was whistlers, luring us into a trap. It looks abandoned, Bill said. Once we were near, he was clutching his leg, holding it in place where I'm sure the bite wound had opened. I never offered to stop, to slow down, to do anything but press onward. I felt certain about the boat, that it was waiting for us, destined for us, our salvation. We slid down the final scree slope and reached the gray pebbled beach where the boat has moored. Or, not moored exactly, but stuck. It was surrounded by driftwood and other debris. Bill looked exhausted, unimpressed. It's a death trap, Ruth, he said. The tide is coming in. Come on, help me get inside. The tide will take us out. The Coast Guard will find us. The Coast Guard will not find us. This area's been iced over for a month. It's suicidal. Do you know anything about sailing? My dad owned a catch. We didn't go out much. I wish. But as I spoke, Bill turned away from the boat and stared into the trees. He was flexing his hands and trembling. Do you hear that? I did hear it. Snapping of twigs, the moaning bends of branches. Then the whistling, deep in the trees, coming closer. Bill was breathing hard, backing towards the boat, keeping me behind him, and the whistling rose in front of us, so that the wailing rose behind, the crying, the singing, summoning me backwards, summoning me onto the boat. The tide was already rising, the boat was bobbing in the water, that was almost deep enough to be whisked away. I hear Ira, I said. What? Bill gave me a bewildered, almost angry look. I hear him singing, and I hear Catherine. He looked sad for me and reached for me, but I backed away into the water. It rose over my shoes and soaked my socks, icy cold. Don't, Ruth, he said. I'm getting on the boat, Bill. There was a ladder down the side of the hole. I could wade to it and pull myself inside. I didn't need his help. You said you wouldn't go back to Red Hill. This is what's left. This is the other choice. The whistling in the trees grew louder, and every second the beach felt smaller and more like a trap. His face changed. The wind rustled his hair. Yes, he said strangely. Yes, you're right. Get on the boat, Ruth. I turned and waded towards the ladder, telling myself he would follow, telling myself all would be well. Why can't you hear it, Bill? I said, as I reached the ladder and pulled myself up onto the weathered deck. Why can't you hear Ira singing? But when I turned around, Bill was halfway up the beach, looking small, facing away from me, his skin white and his arms rigid. Bill? I called. The boat was creaking and deepening in the tide. The wind was rushing across the sand, the bolt jolted underneath me. Something dark appeared beyond the tree trunks. Something I could barely see. It was moving. A shadow independent of the shifting needles and swaying branches. A shape. A being. Taller than a man and deliberate in its movements. I raised my revolver in my shaking hands and fired at it more than once. But there was no reaction. The sound was lost amongst all the others. The screaming and the gnashing and the howling of the whistlers. Bill was close to the woods now. He had to see it. But he was paralyzed. As straight and as movable as the trees. I screamed for him, wishing he would look back at me, but he didn't move. And beneath me, the boat shifted again. I fell and hit my head on an icy rail. And once I had scrambled upright again, Bill had fallen. He was collapsed onto the sand, and the creature was looming closer to him, coming through the trees, crouching down. The whistling hushed, suddenly, almost completely. Even the wind seemed to ease. It takes its prey one at a time. I couldn't hear Catherine anymore, or Ira, but I could hear the whistlers. The softest warning tone. Intelligible now, almost like words. 
telling me to close my eyes. There is always one survivor, always someone spared. The wind pushed the catch away from the shore, and the darkness closed over Bill. I don't remember anything else. December 22nd. My name is Ruth Gadiger. Please bring my body back to Oregon, if you can. My driver's license is in my wallet. This account of the events is for the families of the deceased, for the helicopter pilot and Lillian and Jeff, for Bill and Ira's mother, and the chef we found at Red Hill. I don't want it published. I don't want it to be one more link in a chain of juvenile curiosity. Another mystery in the big book of stories that sends people like us to places like this to die. We had so many opportunities over the years to drop the question, to live with the unknown. We called ourselves folklorists, but we imagined we were adventurers, righteous explorers exposing a mystery. We imagined we had the right. I never thought the Whistlers were actually real before coming here. I thought they were a dark side of the human psyche, just one of the many predictable byproducts of a human life in cold, isolated, untenable conditions. I wanted to sit around a fire with shifty-eyed fur trappers and remote homesteaders and listen to their spooky stories like a tourist. We didn't satisfy our curiosity coming here. Didn't pick apart the tangled lore. We only satisfy the hunger of the thing that stalks this place. It's been here a long time, the chef thought. At war with the whistlers. How long have they kept it at bay? It doesn't even have a name. At this late hour, I find I can't put a description into words. And I don't want to. Because I realize now there are some things we don't deserve to know. There are stories we shouldn't tell, unknowns that should remain unknown. I should have done this in the Jeep with Bill. It would have been better, not necessarily easier, to die in the back seat in his arms, warm, staring out at the ocean. The boat ran aground on a sandbar not far from where I lost Bill. I've been wandering down the coast. I made it back to the Jeep. There are no whistlers following me now. Nothing watching from beyond the trees. The snow is deep. The land has gone quiet. For how long? I don't know. I don't know if I was spared or if the evil that lives here is merely biding its time again. If you found this, the backpack, thank you, whoever you are. I'm out of gas, out of food, and at night, no matter where I look, there are no lights in any direction. It's cold. I close my eyes for a little while. There is still one round in the revolver. I haven't really made up my mind yet. But all right, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you did enjoy, please leave a like because this took way longer than I thought I was going to to read, edit, and put together. Um, I'm going to try to work on a little more, like, I guess my stamina with reading because I know I don't know if it sounded like I was getting tired at the end. But I was exhausted by the end of reading that because I was actually reading it for three hours because I was correcting stuff. Anyway, so yeah, uh, if you guys are new, feel free to sub. Uh, I hope you guys have a good one. And part two will be coming out in a couple of days and it is equally as long. All right. Thanks for watching, guys.